And um, hello, uh, everybody. Um, so this is indeed the research on, um, so the field is the EU anti-discrimination policy and the role of civil society organizations in this policy. And actually, I'm not an expert of intersectionality. That's why I'm very happy to have uh, experts around me today, um, because I discovered uh, the place of intersectionality while uh, working on those organizations and their um, lobbying advocacy uh, strategies. So first, maybe uh, the more general background uh, of this research and the main large questions. Uh, the first big question is the place and role of those so civil society actors in policy making. So it's something that many scholars uh, uh, working on EU governance are interested in understanding um, what is these uh, civil society actors capacity to to put to put certain public issues on the agenda of the EU and their capacity to propose new policy ideas and instruments related to this question is the the nature of this European civil society the term is used a lot by the institutions themselves but it's very blurry uh, very vague, and uh, and this is something that you will see also in the case studies that I will discuss uh, today. You have NGOs, but you also have think tanks, uh, academics, you have even um, foundations. Uh, I will come uh, come back to this. Um, so there is, uh, yeah, my the actors that I look at have this <coughs> diversity. Um, and um, another big issue uh, of this civil society is the weaker representation of um, what we call general interest groups um, in this EU policy making. So general interest is groups that are not corporate, private, uh, as we know those groups uh, have also uh, an influence uh, in the EU policy making. So here, general interest is typically human rights, consumer rights, health, environment. Um, and these groups have uh, yeah, less access to EU policy making in comparison with uh, um, private corporate interest. And um, related to this thing, I mean, a, 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 an element to explain this weaker representation is the lack of funding of resources, both financial, human, um, and um, this is important because this, um, this lack of resources also explains the need to create coalitions uh, and to, to, to develop specific strategies to exist in this uh, EU sphere and to try to influence EU policies. And uh, a small parenthesis, but it's an important one. I just mentioned the issue of funding, and that's why when I started working on um, uh, anti-discrimination, I discovered an actor that I was not expecting. Um, it's the, uh, the, the, the fund foundations, because it's a network of foundations, open society. Um, that is basically the elephant in the room. Uh, recently, uh, Alberto Alemano explained that no other foundation has done more to build and support European civil society. So in terms of funding of capacities. And I also, when I started my field work, many of the actors of this uh, field that I interviewed repeated that without the OSF, this um, anti-discrimination movement of Europe would simply disappear. Um, and uh, OSF is important because, as you will see, it plays a role in the creation of these uh, alliances and also in the promotion of this concept of intersectionality. Um, so now these are the main parts of this presentation. First, I will show you that um, there is so this, uh, this dyna those dynamics of um, partnerships between uh, CSOs and they are partly facilitated by their common funder, which is uh, uh, OSF and uh, which acts as a field builder, so which really contributes to shape this uh, this field of anti-discrimination. The second big uh, topic is, uh, so this uh, question of how alliances are formed, on which topic, on which occasions. And see, it's here that I, I, I found out that intersectionality is so important because it's both um, the occasion of those alliances, 
So different groups, uh, organizations uh, joining forces because they, they will discuss typically uh, intersectional uh, discriminations, for instance, based on gender and religion. And I will give you the example of Muslim women. So this is uh, the occasion to, to, to work together, but it's also the occasion to work for intersectionality, so to promote this uh, concept um, uh, by the, the, the institutions. And um, the, these allowances is the occasion of the, the formation of, uh, so what I call in my paper advocacy triangles, but I, I reproduce here a concept used by um, Alison Woodward, who used the, the, the term velvet triangle that she described in the case of gender uh, equality, so the adv advocacy for gender equality. And those triangles are um, uh, formed by academics, activists, and its institutions. And again, we will see that the OSF fa facilitates those triangles because it has a foot in those three uh, dimensions. And in the last part, I will try to spend a bit more time on the, um, the specific circulation of the of the concept of intersectionality, uh, more specifically from this so acti activist academic realm to the EU um, documents and potentially uh, actions. Uh, so here, uh, it's just a list of the main actors of the uh, advocacy triangle so that you don't get lost in the acronym. So we have the OSF, um, we have um, the European Network Against Racism, which is an umbrella organization based in Brussels, um, with some members in different uh, member states. It's the same for the w U European Women's Lobby. It's also a feminist umbrella organization. We have them the migration policy group. So you see here uh, the different uh, grounds of discrimination. So here it's a group uh, working on, on migrants' rights and uh, it's a think tank. So it's more here on the academic activist side. And the same goes uh, for the center of intersectional justice. Um, and on the institutional side, I will obviously mention the European Parliament and especially the RD intergroup so it's an intergroup of MEPs um, uh, dealing with um, diversity and anti-racism. And finally, the European Commission with, again, different uh, groups that I will describe later on. Um, so far, my research has been mostly a qualitative survey. Uh, so based on all the documents, because here we also talk about the circulation of concepts. So the, the, the writings um, of those groups are uh, very important, their reports, their briefing, obviously also the production of the institutions themselves, uh, grey literature or legal or policy documents, and in certain cases, the academic writings of certain actors. Um, I conducted a series, uh, uh, so far a dozen of interviews, mostly on the CSO uh, side, and I had the occasion to make some participative observation um, in the EP on the occasion of EP hearings, and I participated when possible in workshops, symposiums um, organized by um, those uh, actors. Um, very quickly, because I, many of you are experts of this, so I will not spend too much time, but the general frame is obviously the EU uh, anti-discrimination policy, um, uh, which starts uh, with, I mean, Legally, there is the Article 13 of the Treaty of Amsterdam, which uh, includes new grounds of discrimination. So beyond gender, race, ethnic origin, religion, disability, age, sexual uh, orientation. Um, and with this legal basis, um, the Commission needs also the creation of um, or the, the, the identification of civil society partners and the Commission is at the origin of the creation of INAR, so this umbrella organization. Um, and INAR is a, a, a partner, so really from the civil society, so representing um, those different anti-racist uh, organizations in the member states. 
to participating in the design of this new, uh, those new policies uh, on um, anti-discrimination. Another milestone is the adoption in 2000 of the race equality uh, directive. And also what is interesting here is that, uh, again, civil society actors played a very important role in the swift adoption of this directive and in particular, the migration policy group that I, I mentioned before. Um, now, I need to tell you a few words um, of the Open Society Foundations. Uh, it was created in the 80s by uh, George Soros, uh, an American uh, billionaire born in, in Hungary. And it's what you need to, to remember uh, from this foundation is that it's extremely powerful financially. It's the second biggest after uh, the Gates, uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation. And uh, so I will not even try to give the, the figures, but um, the last figure. So in terms of yearly, yearly uh, um, grants, it's uh, 1,500 million. So this is the money given to civil society groups to exist and to uh, pursue different projects. Uh, the, the OSF is active all over the world on many different issues, uh, democracy, freedom of speech, uh, so the, the functioning of institutions, but also uh, discrimination. And in the EU, it's mostly on discrimination. So it's focusing on marginalized and discriminated groups, and often, often those forgotten by uh, national public policies because they are more controversial uh, so politically uh, uh, non-consensual. So it's really much, very much started with the Roma discrimination. And also it's important because the OSF started being very active in the EU with the enlargement uh, and the Roma population being mostly uh, in the new member states, uh, but also um, uh, Muslims, migrants. And obviously we are in the core of, also of um, anti-discrimination. Um, so this is for the, the OSF and the OSF, again, I, I, I talk about this because uh, it's, it's a field builder in the sense that it really helps institutionalizing and professionalizing uh, city, civil society organizations. It became a core funder of ENAR in 2011. And what is it important? Core funder is that, is that you don't just give one shot grants for a project, for instance is that you are a regular funder. So it allows an, uh, an, an organization to exist in the long term, and also very importantly, to get some independence from public fund institutional funding. And typically ENAR was initially almost completely dependent on EU funding, and it's tricky to lobby an institution that finances you. So to get uh, this uh, a bit more financial independence is very important. Um, and also what is very interesting is that the OSF also funded, so via a, a call for, it's a bit complicated, but concretely it funded the creation of a new coordination for the RD group. So this anti-racism group in the European Parliament. And this group existed before 2014, but it was not very active. And thanks to this intervention of, of, um, of the OSF, the, the group became much more active and also much more successful in the parliament. So basically having more uh, MEPs as members. Um, this field build, builder uh, action of OSF, it's not only through uh, funding, but it's also through its own action as a lobby. Uh, the OSF has a lobby in Brussels, OZP. And here, um, it's also relevant for what I will describe now, those advocacy triangles, because uh, OSF uh, is very much in link with the, the civil society organizations and the activists, because uh, it funds them. Um, but it's also uh, a knowledge network, um, and the legitimacy OSF, of OSF relies very much on its production of knowledge. And, uh, many of its staff, and especially this Brussels uh, lobby, um, they are academics. And not only that they make they made a PhD, very often it's people that had positions or still have some position in the academia, they teach, they make scientific research. 
Um, and on the other hand, some of them uh, had positions in the institutions and they look like um, they're uh, sociolog uh, sociologically uh, and in terms of capitals, their cultural capitals um, are also very much like those of uh, EU officials. Uh, and typically, um, the long-term director of OZP, um, uh, Heather Grabe, um, is a political scientist. And she was also very long an advisor in the commission. So you see that um, it is this intermediary in the triangle because uh, it has this link. It's, uh, as they say themselves, we are in between. So the OSF staff mm -hmm. say we are civil society. Uh, but we are between civil society and the institutions. But also, I add this layer that they have, they are very strong connections with the academia. Um, so this leads me to uh, those advocacy triangles. And here I want to give you some specific examples. Um, uh, and, and it also brings in the concept of intersectionality. Um, in uh, 2014, the OSF was at the origin of a coalition um, aiming at um, promoting ethnic data collection. So we call it equality uh, data. Um, um, as you know, in several member states, uh, these the collection of data related to ethnic or origin or religion is not possible. Um, and this coalition tried to prove the necessity to uh, basically to to push the 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 EU member the EU members uh, member state to to um, to to develop those uh, those uh, data. And you see, the coalition here was uh, the the OSF in Brussels, the Migration Policy Group. Which is a long, uh, long, long established think tank with also strong academic cr uh, credentials, and uh, Inar. Uh, uh, so representing here uh, the, the the NGOs, and it's very much related to intersectionality because uh, a core instrument to put in light uh, intersectional discriminations is data, is the relevant data. Um, um, another example uh, is, as I told you, to bring together organizations for for the cause of groups victim of intersectional discriminations, and typically um, uh, Muslim women uh, uh, suffer from such a, a discrimination. And here again, we have a coalition. So the basis was OSF working for many years on. Muslim discrimination and through reports, uh, data collection showing how women are uh, uh, the first victims of uh, Islamophobia in Europe. Um, and here you see also why it's strategic because the Islamophobia, even the term that I'm using, is controversial uh, for many institutions mm -hmm. and governments. Um, so it's a typically a controversial uh, issue. And uh, on the contrary, uh, gender uh, equality, women's rights, is much more consensual and is also a long established cause in the EU institutions. So there was also this idea from um, the OSF and also ENAR to say, if we also insist on this gender dimension, we might become more accept acceptable uh, for the institutional years. And that's why that trying to create bridges with feminist organizations and typically the European women's lobby uh, was part of this strategy. And, um, and here, again, the OSF uses this multi-position. Um, there was a change of leadership at the European women's lobby in 2014. And the new um, uh, secretary general, uh, Jonah Maycock, had um, um, was quite in favor of uh, um, considering also these race issues and religion issues. And as you know, in the feminist movement, they are also very uh, uh, controversial um, questions. And OSF identified Maycock as a potential ally uh, because of her positions. And um, they offered her uh, a leadership grant. 
So it's one of the um, grants so for new leaders to help new leaders of CSOs to develop their agenda. So they found this ally in the person of Maycock, who indeed supported a specific project on uh, Muslim women. And on the institutional side, um, this coalition could rely on RD, the intergroup. Um, RD, uh, which organized also symposiums, hearings at the parliament, to also expose um, uh, the results of this research of those, uh, so the actions taken in this uh, Forgotten Women um, project. So these are um, a few examples of these triangles that I tried to describe. And now my last uh, point, it's um, to try to follow really the travel um, of uh, the intersectionality concept um, here and here again, I know uh, that the concept traveled in many different spheres, but here it's um, also to, to look at a specific uh, uh, and important action of the Commission, uh, the EU Action Plan Against Racism uh, adopted in 2020. Um, so my story here starts in Berlin um, um, with a center of, for intersectional justice. Here we have an individual, Emilia Roag, uh, a French, so she's not a scholar, but there is an ac ac academia dimension because while she was doing her PhD in France, she made a research stay in Colombia where she met uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. So sometimes, I know this is uh, debated, but sometimes de described as uh, the mother or one of the mothers of uh, the intersectionality concept in the US uh, scholarship. Um, and after working with her, uh, Emilia Roag decided to promote this concept in Europe. So she became the apostle of intersectionality in Europe. This is how she was described. In, a, in an interview. And to do so, she created uh, this think tank, uh, so really described as a research slash activist uh, center. And here again, we are in Berlin, and actually uh, OSF had uh, its main headquarters in Europe in Berlin. And OSF identified uh, Roag again as uh, an interesting um, uh, ally um, and the and her center, of course, as a as a, a an interesting uh, uh, place to to develop advocacy, and it became so it allowed this center to exist. Thanks again, uh, a core funding, and you can imagine that you know um, there is those uh, partnerships between grantees of OSF are quite uh, easy to make. So the connection with INAR in Brussels was uh, very quick. And uh, so this um, CIJ and INAR uh, worked together very quickly. And one of the first results is the, the uh, in organization in Brussels of a symposium on intersectionality. How can intersectionality be mobilized by activists and policymakers? So you already see the different size of the, the, the triangles. Um, and uh, so clearly the agenda of bringing intersectionality in uh, EU, so for, for the EU policy. Um, and concretely, uh, the, the INAR and, and um, CIJ produced a report that they gave, so on intersectionality and how it can be used in EU public policies. And it was given to, to, the, to the parliament, to the commission in December 2019. Uh, you remember that it's exactly in this period that the, the COVID uh, pandemic hit uh, Europe. So the EU had other uh, problems to deal with. But um, Roag continued um, you know, her work of apostle uh, in Brussels, uh, working more and more as a consultant in different uh, uh, groups, um, always on intersectionality. So she, and here I could find her name and also as a, the main speaker in uh, EP hearing, but also in workshops given for the EP. So you can imagine organized by the RD group, but also a specific workshop given for the Equality Task, task Force 
um, of the Commission. So here I need to, to further uh, explore um, who and how, who participated and how. Uh, but uh, then we have a major uh, political event, it's Black Lives Matter. So we are in May 2020, the European institutions needs, uh, need to react to uh, this huge uh, uh, social uh, movement and debates. You have a resolution of the EP uh, explaining, so there is the term intersectional approach, explaining that this approach is necessary to tackle structural discrimination. discrimination. And very quickly, the Commission also um, um, reacts uh, with, and here a strong reaction, basically uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, President of the Commission, charging uh, DG Justice, DG Just to draft a new uh, anti-racism plan for September, so basically uh, three months later. And you have this kind of emergency. Uh, the Commission needs to produce a text uh, in an emergency context. And here my big hypothesis that I still need to uh, elaborate is that the Commission could rely on the work done before by INAR and the Center for Intersectional Justice. And I have already some elements uh, to support my, my hypothesis is that if you take the report of uh, those NGOs and the action plan, you have very strong similarities uh, in, in sentences. So uh, not only in the, in the vocabulary, but in certain formulations and also measures. So for the formulation, you have the mobilization of an intersectional perspective uh, to understand and fight structural racism. And it's the first time in an EP, uh, sorry, commission uh, document and action plan that you have those words uh, used, structural institutional racism. Um, and on the side of the instruments, um, uh, we go back to equality data. So I mentioned this as uh, something core for an intersectional action. Um, uh, here, the commission uh, created roundtables with members uh, representative of the governments and obviously of uh, the civil society, etc., to again um, uh, to push for uh, those this collection of equality dat data and precisely, and it is mentioned in the in the in the action plan, including intersectional data, uh, for instance, religion and gender. So it goes back to our example of uh, Muslim women. Um, so I will conclude here. I hope I was not too long. Um, so what I could already observe from, from, from this research is that indeed intersectionality is both a, a, cat a catalyzer of coalitions. So the attempt to bring together those groups, uh, feminist, anti-racist, uh, working for migrant rights, but also these coalitions work for intersectionality, so for pushing the adoption of an intersectional uh, approach in, um, in the EU um, actions. I also uh, highlighted the, the pivotal role of, uh, of the OSF, uh, also in those advocacy uh, triangles. And what I think I need to look at now is uh, to understand also the limits of those coalitions, because something that I could not describe is that there are a lot of um, ideological divides on, um, especially if we take the feminist and anti-racist groups. And also um, this can explain different understanding and uses of this intersectionality concept. So. Uh, this certainly needs to be uh, uh, deepens. And on more on the fieldwork uh, dimension, um, I definitely need to uh, further explore the institutional side because I haven't um, uh, done any interviews uh, at the Commission yet. And uh, so DD Just and this Equality uh, Task Force are obviously very important actors to uh, investigate. And I stop here and thanks for your attention.